morning, everybody. Pleasure to have you here at our May Energy Environment and Sustainability Network webinar. Uh, this month, our webinar topic is some ideas out of my head about what might be new in, in renewable energy that I've heard about. Hopefully, some of you will make suggestions for other webinars in the coming months as, as we go through uh, the rest of this uh, online, uh, online paradise that we're now all enjoying. I'm actually coming to you from Ipswich, Massachusetts. Uh, this is a picture of our beach from about two months ago. Uh, it's been closed to the general public, but residents are allowed to go on weekends. So that's been nice. And Massachusetts is finally coming out of this. And we, we hope that there's a whole lot of clean energy and sustainability things on tap when, when we uh, come back to, to doing our, trying to run our economy and doing our regular business, those of us who have not been able to be online. I wanted to um, just welcome you to ES EESN and uh, let you know that that we do keep the website with our, some of our events that are going on. Here's here's our sampling of ideas, etc. Um, the idea behind the ESN is just to connect alums. We have a lot to offer in the field of energy sustainability, climate, and just generally getting things done. Uh, and we also want to talk to MIT about things. Bottom of our web page, we um, also feature the plan for climate action. One of our projects right now is getting comments to MIT about how they should uh, prepare the next five-year um, five plan that, that they have to start on. Uh, the symposium that they ran on the research, the four of them that were done before the shutdown are, are the links are available here, that kind of thing. But now for today's uh, webinar. Again, as I mentioned, it's just a sampling of, of people I knew about and people who had written to us uh, who are doing things that I thought were a little unconventional. So first we're gonna hear from Harry, Harvey Haynes, who's, who's also on the screen there. I think you can recognize the two pictures. Um, and uh, he's, he's after a career in oil and gas, he's gotten into geothermal energy, which is, in my, in my mind, a, a really promising thing for doing heating in the Northeast and cooling around the country. Second, we will hear from Bruce Anderson about a solar concentrator technology that he's busy uh, putting into uh, uh, reality, making reality, implementing. And finally, we will hear from Andy Zale, and Andy will give us a little more information about himself for a minute before he starts his presentation. Uh, but it was there in the in the registration page. Uh, he's he's done a lot of um, wind work and uh, boiler. It looks like boiler work, Babcock and Brown. I'm I'm sorry if I'm wrong on that, but but worked on a lot of energy projects over time. So with that, I am going to relinquish the screen and ask Harvey to take us away. Thank you, Sarah. See, can everybody uh, see my slides? You're okay? Thumbs up, Sarah? Slides are okay? Okay. Um, as Sarah said, uh, I spent my uh, career in the oil and gas business. Uh, I graduated from MIT back in 1980 and 82 with uh, degrees in geophysics from uh, course 12, the American Planetary Science Department, and uh, spent uh, my career helping people uh, uh, become energy independent in the US through oil and gas production. Toward the end of that, I realized that uh, that might have been part of the problem. And so um, I started studying more and more about renewable energy. And since I retired less than a year ago, I have gotten into renewables. Uh, the first opportunity that uh, approached me was uh, an opportunity to help with the Virginia Geothermal uh, Heat Pump Association. And so that's uh, what I've been doing the last uh, seven or eight months. So um, this talk is all about geothermal heat pumps. And um, it, just to review uh, how the technology works briefly and then talk about some of the problems uh, with uh, geothermal and uh, getting it more widely used. And you can just see here that still the majority of, uh, of stuff that's uh, sold in the industry is the conventional gas furnaces, uh, air conditioners, and uh, air source heat pumps. And the geothermal has been sitting around 2% of the market uh, for uh, some time now. This is uh, data from last year, but it's, uh, it has not uh, been growing. 
And the question is, is why is that and what can we do to uh, improve that over the coming years? So if you wanna just uh, re renew, review what a geothermal heat pump is, it's a way to uh, pump heat out of the, out of the ground. And uh, typically the ground will re remain at a constant temperature throughout the year once you get down below the, the surface layer, which is the first uh, few feet, and then it's constant. So if you can uh, tap into that energy, you can pull it into your house. And it's a lot more efficient than trying to pull it out of the air because uh, uh, in the wintertime uh, here in Virginia, the, the ground temperature is in the 50s, whereas the outside temperature will be down in the 30s, sometimes the 20s. And it's a lot easier to pump uh, heat out of uh, 50, something's 50 degrees and something that's uh, 20 degrees and more efficient. So that's kind of how it works. And so it requires putting piping in the ground. And this, uh, this example here just shows what we would call a horizontal loop. Uh, most loops nowadays are vertical, which means they uh, drill wells and they stick the uh, pipe into the ground vertically to uh, extract that heat out of the ground. Uh, this is just a slide that shows the, uh, the, the mean uh, surface temperature in the US. And you can see it ranges from about 40 degrees to 80 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the country. And as I was saying, you know, if you live up in uh, International Falls, uh, Minnesota, which is way up in the northernmost part of the 48, lower 48, uh, the temperature there uh, in the ground is 40 degrees year round. But in the wintertime, you can get down well below zero, minus 20, maybe even minus 40. And it's uh, really difficult to pull heat out of that cold air, whereas to pull it out of 80 degree ground it is a lot more efficient. And so that's the reason these geothermal heat pumps are more efficient. And this is just kind of a listing of the typical uh, ways that people use to condition their, their homes. And you can see that uh, propane is the most expensive with uh, fuel oil, um, not much more efficient, or much, not much uh, less expensive. And the natural gas is down here in the middle that used to be considered the most uh, efficient way to heat your house. Air source heat pumps are slightly more efficient than gas heat pumps, but clearly the most efficient is the geothermal heat pump, uh, which is down here on the bottom. It's uh, you know three times as efficient as propane, twice as efficient as gas, and and two and a half times as efficient as uh, fuel oil in terms of cost. In, in addition, uh, geothermal systems tend to last longer. Uh, the actual mechanical equipment uh, lasts longer than a, a gas furnace does. It's typically about twice as long. But the thing that really lasts on geothermal is the is the loop uh, that's put in the ground. They use high density polyethylene pipe. And as far as we know, it lasts forever. They've shown studies that says it'll last 150 years. It's warranted for 50 years, uh, but it clearly lasts much longer. Uh, it's something that just doesn't wear out. And so once it's in the ground, it's probably gonna last as long or longer than the building itself. Uh, we have examples where people have had a, a geothermal heat pump at the ground and they uh, tear down the house and then they'll go and use the existing uh, geothermal loop field and maybe add on to it because the house is bigger. Uh, the, the downfall of geothermal is its cost. So this is a cost I got from one of the sellers of geothermal here in Virginia this week. And he was uh, specking out a, a system for a home. It's a, an average moderate size home. So it had a three ton HVAC system. And the ground uh, the geothermal system was almost $30,000. And this includes almost $10,000 for the ground loop itself. So this is the major reason the geothermal costs more is because you have to put the ground loop in the ground. Um, and you can compare that to a modern high efficiency gas furnace and a high efficiency air conditioner. And that's uh, uh, half the price of the geothermal system. Sometimes it's a little less than half the price. Sometimes it's a little more than half the price. Uh, but this high upfront cost is keeping homeowners from choosing uh, the most efficient, lowest carbon uh, heating and ventilation air conditioning system, which is uh, geothermal. And the only thing that's been sustaining the industry over the years that I can tell, uh, and I'm kind of new to this field, is these uh, federal tax credits of 30%. The federal tax credit went away for one year here in the late uh, teens, uh, I think 1918, I mean 2018, 2017, I'm not, can't remember exact year. And the industry really took a beating that year. And it was only when it came back that the industry started to come back into, into life. So we need to figure out a, a different way to pay for these upfront capital costs that aren't dependent upon uh, federal tax credits uh, that, uh, that make sense. And so I'm gonna go over uh, some of those today and that's really so where some of the new innovations are in geothermal in the last few years. Uh, they've been uh, putting in loans for geothermal for some time. Uh, the loans are typically 10 years, some as long as 20 years. 
there are processing fees to put these loans in place. And so this ups the cost, so this adds to the cost of the geothermal system. And recently there's a credit union that's gone into existence called the Clean Energy Credit Union and it gives out loans and they have no processing fees. And the way they're able to do this is they have a lot of volunteers. And I, I personally don't think that this is sustainable over the long run, but this is one of the best ways to try to uh, fund one of these things right now. So the main people that are putting these systems in the ground right now are wealthy people, wealthy individuals. They can see the financial benefits of uh, doing geothermal and, and they have the capital to put it in. But a moderate person or a person of low income, uh, there's no way that they can afford something like this. So uh, one of the innovations that has come out and has been around for some time is PACE, which is a property assessed clean energy. It doesn't exist in all the states and it requires a public uh, private partnership and it does allow longer term loans. So we've seen loans of 20 to 30 years. 20 years is typical, 30 years is sort of a stretch um, and it can be used for any kind of energy efficiency and it kind of depends upon the legislation that's been put in place. So what happens here is that the uh, PACE loan is secured by a special assessment on the property. So that means the assessment or the loan is not owned by the homeowner or the uh, building owner. Instead, it's, it's owned by the property itself. And so it uh, goes with the property whenever the property is sold. And so that's one way to put in these longer term loans to fund these, uh, these uh, high capital cost things. And, um, if, if something goes into foreclosure, then the, then the loan still stays on the property and whoever the new owner is has to acquire that loan. Unlike uh, loans that are acquired by an owner or a building, those are relieved uh, in bankruptcy court. And the, the capital is still provided by the private sector and the contractor is still put in the, in the equipment itself. So that's been around a while. There've been a few innovations in the cooperative space. These are rural electric cooperatives uh, this is just one uh, uh, cooperative in Illinois. It's uh, the Cord Belt Energy uh, Cooperative, and they've been funding ground loops. And uh, they have had uh, their members. Uh, they're not uh, they're not ratepayers, but they're uh, members of the co-ops in the co-op world. Uh, have been putting in geothermals for some time, and they decided to see if they could help uh, accelerate that by uh, funding the ground loops themselves. So, in in doing this, uh, this uh, allows. Uh, uh, the customer to uh, put in the ground loop and then they get uh, a rebate from the uh, cooperative and then the cooperative then winds up owning the loop and then they charge them a monthly fee of just $28 in their electric bill uh, to pay for that is until the, uh, the loop gets paid off and then it returns to the homeowner. Uh, there's no incentive for the cooperative to own this in the long term because it is just a co-op of its members. And the thing it does for the co-ops is it is it tends to build winter load, which is where electricity usage is lowest and it shaves the peak load in the summer because the uh, air conditioning off of the uh, geothermal is much more efficient than an external uh, AC. And so it, it uh, helps to even out the load over the year for the cooperative. Another uh, innovative uh, has been one that's going on in Austin, Texas. There's a home builder there called Whisper Valley who's building a 30,000 uh, uh, person uh, subdivision and they've been putting in a communal loop field. And so this is actually owned by the Homeowners Association and it was uh, actually highlighted on this old house. Here's a link down here on the bottom if you wanna go and look at the video. But uh, every house there will have, uh, will, will try to approach net zero in terms of their energy usage. And a big part of that is having geothermal heating and cooling on all of these homes uh, that will make the homes much more efficient. And you can see here that the plumbing would provide uh, uh, water that goes into the house in one direction and comes out in another. And this uh, picture was taken early on where they only had two homes that were being built in this uh, subdivision. This is actually being capitally funded out of Austin, but the subdivision is in Austin, Texas. Uh, and last, uh, this is something that Sarah shared with me is uh, up in uh, Lawrence, uh, Massachusetts, uh, the gas company was trying to upgrade their uh, pipes that were going to their, their homes. Uh, I assume that they're old cast iron pipes, which are, have reached their lifetime. They're uh, corroding away and starting to leak gas. And so they're trying to replace them with plastic polyethylene pipe. And typically the polyethylene pipe is smaller diameter, but higher pressure. And so you have to be careful about where you hook these things up and make sure you get the pressure reduction in place. And these guys were acting like idiots and they didn't do that. And so they allowed the high pressure to get into the actual uh, piping that was going to the homes. The homes are filling up with natural gas and several of them exploded. I don't know if you remember this, it made the national news a couple of years ago. And uh, the idea here is uh, 
for have the utility instead of replacing these uh, underground pipes, instead to install geothermal systems and then they could sell the therms instead of the natural gas. And it, I think it's a very innovative thing and it may be something that older uh, utilities may be interested in doing is they are looking to do something instead of replacing their uh, old cast iron pipes. So uh, just to sum up here, uh, typically the problem uh, that we have in geothermal is the capital investment. Uh, utilities really think in terms of capital investments and they think in terms of the long term. They think 30, 50 years. It's nothing out of the uh, ordinary. And you have to remember these loop fields last 100 years. So it's, it's really uh, something that lines up with something that would is what uh, people think of naturally in terms of utilities making these long-term investments. Uh, the current geothermal model requires a homeowner to purchase the loop fields and utility ownership would be uh, a good replacement cost and more in line with uh, typical HVA systems because it would just allow the homeowner to buy the unit that goes in their basement or, or the utility closet, which is uh, more similar to what uh, you're paying. And then the last thing I wanted to pass on is that the states that uh, are most uh, aggressive in terms of getting geothermal installed are probably Illinois and New York. And in, in New York, they're actually looking at what it costs to continue to add new customers to the natural gas system. I don't know if you've been following New York or not, but they've put a moratorium on new gas pipelines in the state and the gas companies have been saying, well, we can't allow, uh, provide growth. Well, if you go and look at what it costs to add a new customer in New York, it's actually pretty high. And, and the, the largest utility, ComEd, it actually costs $33,000 to hook up a, a new customer to the gas system. That funding could go a long way towards putting in a geothermal system and providing that uh, homeowner a less expensive and some would say even more comfortable way of heating their home. So uh, that's kind of uh, where we're at in the geothermal business. So uh, Sarah, back to you. You're on mute, Sarah. Sarah, you're on mute. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I forgot to say a few things about how we're running this webinar. We are taking questions and answers in that little uh, Q&A box. Um, there were a couple of questions and we're going to hold all of the questions until the end of the webinar. But right now we're on pretty good time here and I'd like to give the floor to Bruce Anderson about concentrated solar. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> it's really great to be here. Um, I get to talk about, uh, in a sense, two of my favorite subjects, MIT and 24-7 solar. So um, uh, I'm going to see. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. Uh, share. There you go. Uh, can, can you see that, Sarah? I can. OK, good. All right, 24-7 solar. Um, it is what it implies, rather than uh, photovoltaics, PV, which operates only when the sun shines, we operate every hour of the year. And we consider this the next big leap in clean power. Um, funny thing, people want electricity all the time. And there are ways to get it, but there <clears throat> are very few ways of getting it uh, from a single technology. And, and, and usually you have to cobble together things like PV plus batteries plus a, a diesel gen set or the grid or something like that. And um, it's creating a lot of problems. Uh, so here's just a, a quick summary of, and let's see, I guess I, oh, sorry. Oh. There it comes. Twenty-four-seven solar plants are a game-changing way to produce electricity that generate baseload clean power around the clock, twenty-four-seven in any weather, at costs competitive with PV today and coal tomorrow at scale. These modular turnkey systems use factory-built components, most of which can be manufactured locally with few moving parts for low maintenance and rapid, low-cost deployment. 24-7 solar plants use the world's lowest cost solar mirrors to drive a proprietary hot air based Brayton cycle system that operates at atmospheric pressure and requires no steam, 
molten salts or oils. They combine the world's highest temperature solar receiver, which heats air to 970 degrees centigrade with the world's lowest cost storage, which stores up to 15 hours of the sun's energy as heat instead of electricity. Plus the world's most versatile, reliable power generator to create a breakthrough third generation CSP system that stabilizes grids by responding instantly to changing demand. 24-7 solar plants eliminate most disadvantages of conventional CSP, PV, wind, and traditional power and offer unmatched benefits for project developers and grid operators. They can be deployed on uneven ground and configured as a single off-grid system of 400 kilowatts or as utility-scale farms of unlimited capacity. Short project cycles, lower O&M, and competitive margins mean attractive returns for investors. 24-7 Solar. The business opportunities are breathtaking. So that pretty much sums up. I'll tell you more. 24-7 uh, Solar, uh, we founded in, in 2015, but its ancestors have MIT origins, uh, uh, started way back when, to actually um, commercialize a couple of MIT patented technologies that were invented by Professor David Gordon Wilson. Um, and uh, we've gotten uh, federal funding to develop this. Uh, we assembled uh, a team of, of, of t global technology partners uh, from Germany and Australia and France uh, and the US to develop this technology over a period of several years. Uh, in fact, we've put $20 million into developing this technology. And basically what we've done is developed the highest temperature solar product in the world. Uh, our system can heat air to almost a thousand degrees centigrade. We think in the future we can exceed a thousand. Uh, it has multiple applications. And the one I'm gonna show you today is the first one. We can generate electricity and, and heat waste heat from, from the engines that we use every hour of the year. Uh, we can desalinate and purify water. Um, our system, instead of using solar to heat the air to drive the turbines, can actually use heat uh, from exhaust, gas from uh, industrial processes. Uh, we think it has the potential to thermochemically produce hydrogen and maybe other synthetic fuels. Uh, so the platform's initial product is the 24-7 solar plant. Uh, we've actually called it a product uh, and labeled it. Um, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So here's the problem. Um, on the one hand, it's great news. You know, the world is rapidly developing or adopting uh, green technology. But unfortunately, almost all of it is intermittent. You can't, you can't count on it. You can't flip the switch on at night and expect uh, for PV to, de to deliver you power. And um, the more that is of, of this intermittent power that comes onto a grid, uh, the more unstable the grid is, uh, just obvious. Um, so the solution is something that can operate all the time. And uh, so, now, CSP is concentrated solar power. Concentrated solar power is basically the only 24 seven clean power technology. Now you can have geothermal in a different form than Harvey was discussing. Uh, and even there, the, you can't count on it every hour of the year. The technology goes down, has problems. Um, uh, now, not to say that ours doesn't, but I'll show you why uh, we can count on ours every single hour of the year. Um, so you may recognize concentrated solar power it comes in this form. You may have heard about uh, the Ivanpah project and uh, the killing of birds in southwestern United States. Uh, there's something called linear Fresnel lenses, where those mirrors focus up onto that that line running there uh, that has high temperature fluids running through it. Um, or you may have heard about parabolic troughs, uh, the same kind of thing. Um, there's a line, uh, I don't know if you can, I can probably see this pointer running 
there at the focal point of those troughs. Uh, they, what they do is create high temperatures, but they're only like, you know, uh, 450 to maybe 500 degrees centigrade. Uh, and this is used to uh, create steam to generate conventional steam turbines. And frankly, conventional steam turbines take an army to operate. Um, they're, 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 they're challenging technologies. So here's, here, here are the three advanced technologies that we've developed, that we've integrated into a proprietary system. Uh, first is the power block. Now, um, every, uh, a, a turbine is a power block, a, a steam turbine, but we don't heat water, we heat air. And what we've done is, is taken the most reliable small engine and added a heat exchanger. And that heat exchanger exchanges the heat from the sun and transfers it to the compressed air in the turbine. And then we've added a new combustor to back up. So this doesn't operate on solar every single hour of the year. That's really impossible almost everywhere in the world. So if you do want power every single hour of the year, you have to burn a fuel. We're fortunate that we can burn most biofuels. We can't burn solids, but we can burn liquids and gases. Our, our initial system that we're building now is 400 kilowatts, and these are very low maintenance devices. Uh, just a, a few, literally a few hours a year of routine maintenance. So here's, here's the, the device on, that sits on top of the tower. I'm gonna show you the system in a minute. Um, it, it operates at these really high temperatures. And basically it too is a heat exchanger only, or an energy exchanger. It takes the heat from the light from the sun and converts it to heat and then transfers that heat to the air. I'll show you that in a minute. No moving parts. And then finally, the thermal storage system. Now, this storage system, in, in, in a lot of ways, we did not invent it, but we have developed it into something for this system. It's been around 150 years in steel refining business. For those of you familiar, um, these are called Culper stoves or hot stoves. They take the high temperature uh, exhaust gas uh, from the refining process and they, they pass that high temperature through these, um, uh, what they call copper stoves uh, filled with fire brick. And then they, they use that heat to preheat the combustion air in the furnace. And we use it to store the heat. It's very, very cheap. No moving parts, lasts forever. So here's how we've integrated the system. Uh, here's the engine I talked about, uh, the receiver, it sits on top of the tower, uh, the thermal storage, which of course is very heavy, sits on the ground. These are the, these are the heliostats, the reflecting mirrors. They reflect the light up into the receiver during the day. The cool air from the bottom of the storage and from the exhaust from the turbine uh, go up through the receiver, come back down in this red pipe here. Some of it's diverted to storage while some of it goes to power the turbine. And then at night, uh, these are blocked off with dampers, these two going to the receiver. And so now you've got the exhaust from the uh, turbine going, reversing the flow through the storage and then back to the uh, power block. Um, and then of course, when the energy storage is empty, um, we can burn fuel. We're looking at some mining applications <clears throat> and, and we're looking at how to get up to two days of storage uh, in this, with this system. Uh, so there's no, no basic limit. And it's, they're of course, super well insulated to lose as little heat as possible. So this is what the system looks like. Um, we'll have photographs before too long rather than drawings. Um, fact, it's factory produced. So it's, it's all pre-standardized. Um, you don't have to design this every time you want to deploy it. It's like a wind machine in that sense. Uh, so it's also rapidly deployed, little risk, very few moving parts, very reliable. Um, and they, the markets are huge. We can put this in the middle of nowhere. 
um, or we can, like wind, uh, put lots of them together and create uh, utility scale projects. And of course, we have globally protected this, this system. So here are multiple systems in the same, same location. Um, now, the reason that we can essentially guarantee power every single hour of the year without another power plant as a backup someplace else, like all power plants in the world have, we don't need that. Um, if one of these systems you're looking at goes down, you've got a whole bunch of others and they don't go down very often. Um, these are some of our initial target applications. Obviously, when you come out with a new technology, you have to be very careful. Um, in startup parlance, uh, we, we, we call beachhead tech, uh, a beachhead market, the one that you're gonna attack first or like Eisenhower did with Normandy Beach. And um, we've chosen the mining sector and the mining sector, uh, at least the off grids because um, so much of their uh, expenses are the fuel to generate uh, the electricity that the mine uses. And they operate 24 seven, uh, a lot of are in sunny places. Um, and there's a lot of other, uh, uh, a lot more to the value proposition for mines than I'm explaining here. Um, we're excited that this can bring uh, electricity to the roughly a billion people who don't have any or don't have enough because it can be built off grid in the middle of nowhere. Same with industrial processes. Uh, we can provide uh, industrial combined heating and power. Uh, uh, we can take the heat off our engines, supply them to the industrial process. And then uh, we've got desalination. Both our heat and our electricity can be used in a extremely efficient uh, desalination water purification process. And then of course, finally, power only. Uh, we expect utility systems only when we've really proven the technology and we've really gotten our costs down. So what, what have we really done here? What we've, what we've done in addition to developing these um, exciting technologies is that we've used mass production to drive down the cost. We took our cue from photovoltaics and from um, uh, wind. Uh, the primary way that those technologies have uh, significantly reduced their, their costs over time. And by the way, um, they are wind and solar are competitive now almost everywhere in the world compared with coal and gas. Um, it's mass production. Uh, the world is built on mass production, but concentrated solar power has never turned to mass production before. So we've, we've just, just about everything. Uh, initially, not the thermal storage, but there are a handful of people all over the world working on ways to produce the, the heat storage we need in factories and ship it to the site, uh, basically operation ready, as all the other components are. We've, and, and that also means we've minimi minimized on-site construction time or cost. And again, that's what PV and wind have done. Uh, a standard, this is required standardizing the product like wind machines. So obviously we're copycats, we, we, we've copied wind. Very few moving parts, um, mostly off the shelf components. Even the ones that we've designed, a lot of those are uh, uh, basically extrapolations of what's, um, uh, what's being made. And, and, uh, and a lot of these components can be made in the countries where we deploy uh, the system. And then finally, we've added this long-term energy storage, which is very, very cheap. Batteries are, are actually super expensive. And as a student of batteries, because it's a potential competitor, um, I know that it's gonna be very, very challenging to store electricity as cheaply as it is to store heat. And by the way, our storage system can do many of the same things that, the battery, that our battery can. Uh, it can actually absorb excess electricity from the grid. And there's a lot of it because of PV and wind. One minute left, Bruce, thank you. And, and, uh, and then turn it into heat and then we can use it in our system to give it back. Um, we're, we, we, we think we're pretty well organized. Um, we weren't planning on COVID, but 
But uh, fortunately, we're in phase one. Uh, we're building our, our first commercial demonstration project. Uh, currently, the plan is Morocco. Uh, and, uh, and gratefully, I'm not there right now uh, with, with Natalie. Uh, but instead, we're uh, home in Virginia. But uh, given COVID we, and the uncertainties associated with it, we just don't know what our schedule is going to be. Uh, so we can tread water for a while, uh, actually for quite a while, uh, while, while COVID uh, runs its course, no actually almost no matter how long it takes. But um, we expect that, uh, that in three or four years, uh, we'll be selling the company um, and that will be, this will be a, a major, major new way of generating power at a large scale. Um, people love this technology. We get, we're constantly approached uh, just out of nowhere with interest about our technology and be happy to talk to you about it some more. And oh, by the way, if you're interested in talking about investment, there's my contact information. Thank you very much. And thank you, Bruce. Um, very good. Again, we're taking questions and answers. We it, it's hard for us to, to, to get the questions that we're going to ask after the three speakers when we have a rolling list of things. Um, so please um, put questions in and we'll, the speakers have agreed to help uh, answer other questions we can't get to in this hour. Um, so, so far, so good. And now we're up to Andy Zale, who, uh, Andy, if you would just tell us for a minute about who you are and how you came to this, this new uh, idea for wind power. Um, that would be helpful and take it away, please. Thank you. I think the easiest way is if I share the screen with you and I show you the uh, PowerPoint and I wanna make sure I get the right PowerPoint um, because that, that shows the, um, the path forward on how we came to this place. And um, I'm leafing through here. Andy, okay. you're a classmate of uh, Bruce's, right? Class of 69? Uh, Bruce, were you in uh, Arrow? Uh, yeah. Okay, we're, yeah, there you go. We're, we're, yeah, we're the, both in there. The same one. Yeah. I ended up doing my master's thesis on solar energy in, 60, in uh, 73. Um, I did my master's uh, in 71 uh, with Sheila Widnall on uh, uh, wake vortex avoidance for the Air Force. And it turns out that's relevant to wind turbines because that's how you, that's how you site wind turbines. You want to put, put site the wind turbines far enough apart so that you don't have uh, wake interference. And uh, we did that for NASA and other people. So uh, my background is in fluid mechanics. And here you see um, one of the best performing wind farms in the world. It's the uh, South Point Wind Farm in Hawaii. At Andy, South your Point. screen's not up yet, so, so try it again. Oh, okay, let's see. You have, to, you have to hit share screen. Yeah, I think he was working on that, but let's see. Oh, <laughs> good point, let's see, let me go back. It's, it's at the bottom of your screen, I think, Andy. It's a, usually a green. Well, it might be at the top on your computer. Yeah, the, uh, let me just shrink this and uh, get out of it and show. Okay, and then I need to move this. No, you need to share screen. Something on the Zoom. Okay, uh, I pushed share screen. And now uh, there's the screen, share. There it goes, very okay. good. Now I need to open it. No, 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 it started. Okay, open it. Oops. There you go. There we go. Okay, and then we go to the um, start. Presentation mode, yeah. Got it. So this is the, the highest pro producing wind turbine in the world uh, that I understand. Uh, it's the GE 1.5 turbine at South Point in Hawaii. And the reason it's the highest producing, it's got a 63% net capacity factor. So when we talk about net capacity factors, 63% means that on the average, it puts out 63% of 1.5 uh, megawatts, which is a, about nine megawatts a year. So it puts out a lot of power. 
And the reason that it does that is because it's the windiest site in the world. It's just south of the volcano and the wind blows so far that they actually had to uh, pave the access roads to keep the uh, dust from going into the wind turbines. So this is the challenge. On the other side, oops, you see the, um, Technical difficulties here. You see the other turbine, which is the. Um, see, I'm having a little trouble with my mouse here. Andy, don't get, worry about going back. Just tell us a little bit about the other turbine because we're now looking okay, at got the it. wind So the resource. other turbine is the um, is the high wind turbine, which is a um, six megawatt uh, Siemens turbine uh, offshore in Scotland, which is one of the best wind resource areas offshore. And that has the same capacity factor. So the bottom line is that if you uh, pick a very good site, you can get very high energy yields. And it turns out that um, you can do very well on land, but we don't have much land left. And so that's why we're going uh, offshore. So you see that the offshore wind potential is about two times the US load. The offshore wind potential onshore is greater than offshore. I'm, the offshore is greater than onshore. And the other point is that we live right next to a world-class wind resource. So here's where we are. We're right next to this beautiful uh, wind resource. So the question is, what can we do to, um, to move this forward? Well, this is where we are right now. And um, this is a, a job opportunity because here in the US, we only have one offshore project which is the five GE turbines at Block Island. There's Block Island. In Europe, they have 107 um, offshore projects, which is five gigawatts. It's like five nuclear plants. So they've got offshore wind um, all over. And so the US is about 8% of the um, European market. And so the US is just getting its feet wet. The other point of it is that the US, that the, um, Europeans are basically doing most of the work. These are the um, leases that were offered. Uh, they went for 1800 megawatts and uh, the leases went for 425 million. And they're all uh, won by European companies. There were 19 other people that didn't win. So uh, it's an emerging market. So the question then is, um, how can we go into the deep water where you saw the best wind resource and this is the available technology. The first one is the tension leg platform where the, um, the restoring force is by these tendons. It's like an underwater buoy. The next one is more like a high water plane uh, ship where the restoring force is by uh, buoyancy and also by cabling. And then the last one is a spar buoy where you have um, the restoring force by gravity and you have um, a passive anchors. And this, uh, these pictures illustrate what a low water plane floater looks like versus a high water plane floater. And it also shows you the scale of the turbines. The turbines today are giant. They're like twice what you saw before. And um, in comparison, um, you see the Eiffel Tower. Well, um, the um, Hancock building is, would be actually smaller. It would be a down here like the Seattle Space Needle. So that's the challenge is to put these giant turbines on steady foundations in the highest wind resource areas. And if you're a sailor, you know what happens when you go out sailing. Okay, so the current limitations. In my mind, the, the biggest um, limitation is R&D to develop an integrated floating foundation. And here you see what the mechanics are involved to do that. You start with aerodynamics, but then you have the wind flow, which is the uh, prime mover, then you have aerodynamics, hydrodynamics, control systems. So all of these challenges are worthy of a place like MIT or other US universities. Right now, the center of excellence is in Denmark at the Danish Technical University. Here is a picture of what the um, current technology is, and it shows the limitations. This is the high wind spar buoy uh, installed in a fjord in Norway using the very largest marine cranes that are available. This is just a six megawatt turbine. It's not the 12 megawatt. And the water is very deep. It's a fjord. Well, we don't have a fjord in Boston and we don't have uh, these kinds of ships that are Jones Act compliant. Jones Act means that you have to have a US vessel to go from US port to port. 
The other challenge we have is the port facility. Here's what the um, French are doing. This is the French donut system, which is a high water plane floater. And you can see they have to build a whole new port to be able to um, assemble and erect the turbines. So what's the exciting new technology? This is what Sarah said. Tell me something exciting. What, what's under, new under the sun? Well, what's under the new under the sun is that we can put it into an existing port. Here's uh, Kalaola Harbor, Barbers Point in Hawaii. We designed a system for this harbor that you could do it without having to redo the whole harbor. And the way we do it is number one is we build the spar buoy and we float it out horizontally. So we can build the spar buoy here, float it out, and then we ballast it vertically. This is the Navy ship called FLIP, where they, it's an oceanographic ship, but they use ballasting uh, to be able to handle the ship and then, um, and then do the you know, oceanographic work. The other piece that you need is you need that ocean going deck barge. Here's a, a US type of um, ocean going deck barge that can do these operations. So you come into port, you take the, the turbines on, on deck, you do two turbines at a time, so that um, you, you minimize the uh, construction cycle. It's got an aft uh, notch with these uh, retaining rings, hard points. So what you can do is you can float the, the uh, spar buoy under the, um, the aft end of the um, ocean going deck barge and lock it in. Then you can erect the turbine on the ocean going deck barge using these three cranes, the um, gantry crane, um, the jib crane, and then um, you have strand jacks. So the end product is that you can erect the turbine at the site in a deep water site at a minimum construction cycle using an ocean going, a, a Jones compliant ocean going deck barge. And then you can free float it and you end up with a uh, system like this. New materials technology. This is what um, we just have that nano center at, at MIT. Well, one of the things they could do is come up with a ceramic composite spar buoy. And what you do is you start off with geopolymer cement with basalt fibers. You use basalt reinforcing bars instead of steel. And the basalt geopolymer form a strong chemical bond which controls cracking. Here's That's what great. Andy, you have five minutes left. So okay. if there's more than five slides, try and, and uh, cover them quickly. So this is the technology. Um, let's go to the next one. So um, the marine construction. So there you have the um, spar buoy. Uh, being constructed in port. It's basically a cylinder, a concrete cylinder with, with enough room for the tower to be lowered into it. And then you have this piston here uh, with strand jacks so that you can erect the whole turbine using the ocean going deck barge. And uh, so this lends itself to the spar buoy and it's an integrated system. So what is the problem and solution? Well, the problem is the 12 megawatt turbines are too big to install. We don't have a US R&D. We're missing Jones Act compliant vessels. The European companies are poised to dominate. And to me, the question is, where's our Yankee ingenuity and 500 years of seafaring history? Well, one of the ways you could do that would be to, um, to do wave tank tests. This was what we did at uh, Marin at the largest wave tank test and come up with a system that works. So what is the future of offshore wind technology? Well. Uh, we have 500 years of seafaring history, and the new turbines are about equivalent to 16 of these large ships, 16 US constitutions. So you can imagine what the overturning moments are. And then here's MIT, and MIT is going to solve the carbon neutrality issue by 2050 or 2060, or maybe even earlier with the Massachusetts mandates. And so what is the future? Well, I'm hoping the future is that our kids and our, our, our grandchildren will have a job doing offshore wind. And um, one of the ways you can participate is uh, there's an MIT energy symposium coming up in August. We're going to present a more detailed um, presentation of this technology. And what we're doing is uh, we're putting together a team. There's a, um, a DOE FOA um, proposal application that's due in July. And so we're soliciting people to um, put together the team so that um, they, you get a five to uh, $10 million grant. And uh, I would like to see MIT or some other university lead the charge. That's basically the, uh, the, 
the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be glad to answer it. And you have my contact information down here. Um, yeah, leave that up for a minute, Andy. Thank you very much. This is excellent. This was a, a nice, clean uh, explanation of what you're trying to get some research done on. So we will be sending out uh, follow-up emails. And for right now, I'm going to try and scroll through some of the questions and answers and see if our panelists can can help some of our attendees understand um, a little more about what they've been talking about. Um, one question that came up, um, what about how, how the environment is in, impacted by some of these? The geothermal um, question was, are you going to be uh, dropping underground temperatures by pulling heat out? Um, there's a question about um, whether we use potable water, whether you're using potable water for the concentrated solar and uh, whether the concentrated solar actually raises the ambient air temperature. Um, and uh, there was another, uh, another environmental question in here. Uh, it was a question about 24-7 uh, environmental uh, and also the wind, the wind turbines out in the ocean. What sort of environmental effects do those have? So Harvey, if you would start off about the underground and then Bruce, talk a little bit about environmental impacts of your concentrated solar and uh, Andy, then, then the uh, offshore wind. I, I tried to answer this question online, but um, basically uh, the, the geothermal does uh, lower the temperature of the, uh, of the ground whenever you're pulling heat out, heat out in the wintertime and it raises the temperature in the ground whenever you're dumping heat into it uh, in the summertime. Uh, the, uh, there is a recovery in the ground that's just natural due to heat flow in the ground, uh, but uh, it, it can be overwhelmed by the, the geothermal system if the loop field isn't big enough. So you have to size that loop field big enough so that it's a, it's a minor effect uh, so that it'll go through the entire season and you'll still get your, uh, your heating out of the ground that you need to heat your dwelling. Thank you. Bruce. So uh, environmental issues, so far, so far we haven't found any. We don't use any exotic materials. Uh, we don't use water except to wash the mirrors. Um, the, uh, the towers are relatively short, only 125 feet tall. Um, um, we haven't come across any yet, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure we will. Um, but we're, we're, we are working hard trying to figure out what they will be. You mean there's no endangered species out in the desert in Morocco? <laughs> well, first of all, there aren't. But secondly, uh, the heliosats that, that, that we prefer to use don't, don't, don't impact the soil. Uh, they, they, uh, there's no foundation. We're not digging trenches or foundations or any of that. They just sit there. Okay. So the, so the ambient air doesn't well, the ambient air between the heliostats and the tower, does that increase? Is that a no. thing? No. Okay. No, it's the, just the radiation. It's not the heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just light. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. And Andy, what have you heard about um, environmental impacts or, and whether this is how, how, the, how the floating uh, towers might, might be better or worse? Birds, for example, trying to fly by, uh, that kind of thing. Right. Well, uh, as you saw before, in Europe, there's about five gigawatts of uh, offshore wind already working. And uh, the uh, report card is very good. Uh, we've not had any massive bird kills or anything like that. The Danes have been leading the charge, and they have done a lot of surveys. They find that birds avoid uh, offshore wind turbines. Uh, they have these flocks of migrating birds, and they avoid it. So um, BOEM here in the US is doing a very good job of, of looking at the environmental impacts. So before you get a lease from them, uh, you have to go through that. And what BOEM looks at uh, mo mostly is what the, the marine fauna and fauna is. So what is the bottom impact? You know, the uh, disturbing the, uh, the uh, sea floor. And you can see that what you wanna do is minimize the number of anchoring cables. You also don't wanna have any drilling um, or jackhammering because that affects the whales. And the site that, uh, that we showed you before is outside the, um, outside the whale sanctuary. So when you look at the Gulf of Maine, 
when you look at the Gulf of Maine, there's a uh, there's a uh, a marine sanctuary. Oh yeah, right here. There's a marine sanctuary right here, and we're just above the marine sanctuary. So uh, good. You're above Stellwagen. Good. Yeah, above Stellwagen uh, whale sanctuary, and we're also in very deep water, and we're also far away from shore. The other wind farms like Block Island is only three miles offshore. So you can right. see the turbines very, right. very easily. Okay, quickly, let me just um, have a couple of, of answers. There were um, questions about the technology. One is um, Dean EG has been asking lots of things and commenting along the way. What's the kilowatt per acre uh, for the concentrated solar? Does How does it compare to uh, photovoltaic electric, Bruce? Um, the measure isn't um, how many kilowatts per acre, but but how much um, how many how much uh, electricity can you produce per acre, uh, measured as kilowatt hours, uh, since that's what people use, and our system produces twice as many kilowatt hours per acre compared with PV. And and do you know the overall efficiency? Uh, uh, tell me what you mean by efficiency. Mm -hmm. And we can't get into that. It's a very complicated question. Okay, we can we can have that answered afterwards. Yeah. Um, and then um, the the um, how do the in general we have about two three minutes left. How do the economics compare with existing technologies for power, excluding any subsidies? Uh, Harvey, do you know that on the geothermal? Let's go through in the order you, you talked, you spoke Could this you morning. Could you ask that question again, Sarah? How does the economics of geothermal compare with existing technologies for uh, both conventional and perhaps some of the renewable energy technologies? I tried to go through some of that in my presentation, but the geothermal typically costs about twice as much to put in as a conventional high efficiency uh, natural gas and uh, air conditioning systems. That's for an individual home, right? For an individual home. And um, uh, they typically don't, uh, well, I guess they've done a few of these for large uh, uh, buildings, but I'm unfamiliar with those economics. Uh, okay. But they last uh, much longer. They last twice as long and the loop will last forever. So- it's And the cost of running them uh, is, is somewhat less. So your operations uh, are very different. For gas and a third for propane, yeah. Great. How about um, Bruce? Well, we almost come to the end of our hour. Not yet. <clears throat> I, yet. You have to clarify a question like that. Um, economics to whom? Um, what's the application? Uh, for example, we, we can't um, recharge phones. Um, but um, uh, if you want 24 hour a day, every day of the year, power generated from clean technology, um, since we don't know of any others that do that, um, ours is the most efficient and the most economical. Okay. So that's why you <laughs> so, that's I mean, why you're trying to find a match of, of customers and demand. Is that correct? Yeah, as we know, and this is really an important message. Um, there's so many different applications for using electricity, and not there won't be a single solution. So you have to look at a particular solution when you ask a question like that. That's great. We have one minute, Andy. Um, what, how do the economics of, of what you're proposing compare with uh, standard offshore wind or even onshore wind? Right. And we have only a minute. I have to right. wrap so up in a minute. This is, uh, this is Block Island. They got an $84 per megawatt power purchase agreement using uh, bottom founded foundations, oil gas technology, uh, European cranes. Our um, goal is to uh, save, save on the installation cost and reduce this by 50%. We think we can do that uh, if we apply American Yankee ingenuity and, and we have a supply chain in the US. Uh, I think it's a lot cheaper to have cranes uh, over here in the US than to ship them all the way from Europe. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we do that with tunneling equipment too. We ship it from Europe. We put a big outfall on our wastewater plant. Yeah, yes, That's yeah. great. Good, good. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we will be getting back to you with, with um, 
some of the Q and A written up uh, that we can we can find. Please contact the, the speakers directly uh, and write to alumnienergy at mit.edu if you need more of the information. Um, so uh, there's there's a lot of promise ahead, and and maybe if we use uh, some of our not only ingenuity but invest some of our resources, we we can get to non-carbon maybe through some of these ways and maybe through some that that we think of as more uh more accepted in our marketplace so thank you very much harvey and bruce and andy and uh that's our webinar today next month we will be having another one uh eesn will be publishing in the alumni learn email that says free for alumni so that's the first place you'll be able to see it and check our website uh for other things that may be going on I try to keep it up and, and a little different all the time. So uh, I, I thank you all for, for being here. And uh, we will, it, there were over 100 people on the webinar today, I believe. So we're very excited about that. We wanna continue the conversation among alums about how we're, how we're gonna get to the future, to a clean and sustainable future. Thank you. Thanks for organizing, Sarah. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Very good. <laughs>